Welcome back to another edition of the Founders Table. Pull up a chair to the Founders Table where we talk about the issues that founders face coming from founders who've been there many, many times before. Uh, Anthony Bashilio is out today, but you guys are in for a real treat because I've got my main man. He's founded multiple eight-figure businesses, including the business that he's building right now, which is called The Program. So it's time to get with The Program and check in with my man, Mr. Nick Alfano. What's up, brother? What's up, man? Welcome to welcome back, I should say, to yeah. California. Yeah, it's... Uh it's always uh, a little bittersweet coming home here. Yeah, so, so Nick is a uh, California native, California resident. Fun fact, he and I are both 909 kids. Yeah. Uh, you might be 951. We were 909 for a while, and then okay. we switched to 951. Yeah, and if, so. you, if you don't know what that is, I'm sorry. We ain't got time to go into it, but it pretty much means we're badasses. And we, uh, we, we don't have, well, he's got some degrees. I don't have a degree, but we got a PhD in the School of Business and the School of Hard Knocks. So, um I don't know. I was trying to think where we should dive in because, I mean, how many businesses have you have you founded? Uh, when you met me, I had seven LLCs because I <laughs> thought that was a cool thing to do. Well, um, actually, let's let's talk <laughs> about that for a little bit. So, so Nick Nick had actually seven different businesses. So let he, me t- let me say why real quick. Whoa, 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 hold okay. On. okay, but let's let me <laughs> I'll go. I'll try to justify it before you run me too hard. Let, let me go through right. it first. All right. So you had you had a, a law firm, law firm, a debt settlement company, yep. a clothing company. Yep. A cannabis company, yep. a printing company, I think. Yeah, screen printing. Screen mm-hmm. printing company. Staffing agency. Staffing agency. And uh, oh man, what else? And well, then the consulting firm. And like a, like a pro, uh, like a protein shake company. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's some things that can't be mentioned on this call probably <laughs> as well. So. All right, yeah. so you had you had seven LLCs. Why the fuck did you have seven LLCs? Because, uh, raise your hand if you've heard of Warren Buffett. So I, you know, new to the game and trying to figure out how to kind of model my 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 business strategies, my entrepreneur roadmap. I was modeling after the greats, and um, Warren Buffett had a line. It still has the line, but he said an average millionaire has seven sources of income, seven streams of income. So like my ignorant ass went out and literally opened seven LLCs and then continued to spin seven plates and think. Um, think i was awesome it was, it was a huge ego play but i didn't realize warren buffett meant passive like, get <laughs> well, one up and get it going <laughs> and he probably meant like he probably meant like over time you yeah know? like nope this is all done <laughs> yeah. i think they all, all the startup dates are within like six months you know what I, mean? I i rather than start one business let me start seven because yeah. one isn't hard enough yeah uh so how'd that work out well, so the reality was, so here was my favorite line, and actually I've heard this line from a few entrepreneurs now that I'm on the other side of the fence, was like if I was at a networking event and they're like, so what do you do, bro? I was like, what don't I do? Ah. <laughs> like total total doucher, right? Uh. Um, all that to say, yeah, the, basically the way it works is imagine again, for those of you that are my age, 42 plus, um, the old like Chinese acrobat that's spinning plates on the mm. sticks and one starts to wobble and he's got to go spin it real quick. And then, so like one or two were always doing pretty well, but then any profits that were coming for those were feeding Going the ones that the were other. bleeding, right? So like this plate was looking good and this one was starting to wobble. And the reality is I didn't know how to actually build a team. You know, like we're, we're at a stage now in our career where it's like you don't build a business, you build people and those people build right. your business. Amen. So I was, I was still like wearing all the hats for all seven companies. And so as soon as I stepped away from one, it just, it suffered dramatically. So it was, it was pretty, so I, 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 I mean, obviously, like Warren Buffett has, I, I don't know how many companies yeah. under Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, I think they're one of the largest employers in the world. But maybe I think where we got a little misguided was that it was probably over time yeah. to have those passive income streams. And the thing is, is that, you know, I don't think, I mean, shit, how, how long ago was that? Five years ago? No, but you had five years. You had you had five of them going, or you had seven of them going five years ago. But yeah, is that when you started them? You probably started them long before. Yeah, that, yeah, right? yeah. Somewhere three or four years old. So like, um, I would say this is over the course of, like I said, I opened seven LLCs and then kind of aged them. But actually, seven verticals up and running simultaneously took probably five years. Wow, yeah, wow, five or six years. All right, so now where's where's those seven LLCs? Now? <laughs> Every single one is dead except for one, <laughs> it would, and it's still like. Only alive because it's it's a ten year company with an awesome like credit score, and we just you know ran a new fictitious like DBA under it. So yeah, burned everything. So I guess then it would be uh, sufficient to say that founding a company is fairly easy. Yeah, but building a foundation of a solid company is is probably the hard part. Completely different game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and then it's anybody it's, can go spin up an LLC and put CEO on a business card and. 
And you know, they, you know, the problem I think I think one of the big issues you're seeing right now in the industry is the entrepreneur is the new black. You know, mm. like orange is the new black or pink is the new like it, entrepreneur is the new thing. Mm. Like you know, I like gu- that. guys like Gary Vee. Everyone's just making it cool to be an entrepreneur or have a side hustle. Um, but the reality is, it's a it's not for everybody, and and b it's one of the most difficult, loneliest roads you'll ever embark on. So. But everybody thinks it's cool, right? Yeah. Everybody's like, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a digital nomad. I'm a yeah. I'm an e-commerce guy, and it's like. Are you really? Yeah. Are you? Yeah. Like, are, like, like, just because you have an LLC, it, just to be clear, like the Founders Table podcast is not just like you founded a company and and then you're all of a sudden you know like you get a seat at the table. Now we invite everybody to the table, but in order to to actually have a conversation around the Founders Table, you actually have to be doing something yeah. with your business. Yes, you actually have to be moving the, the 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 proverbial needle. You have to have real revenues. You have to have a real company you have to have a real north star that is what our definition of a founder is because like that i've never heard that that's actually great i'm going to steal that yeah. uh, that entrepreneur is the new black you know and, and everybody wants to be an entrepreneur it's like this it's this, sexy in, in theory yeah. well yeah, yeah it sounds good and <laughs> yeah. then and then they they end up you know they what do they go after they go after time freedom and financial freedom and where do they end up uh, with neither yeah one, one of my favorite things to say is you don't own a business your business owns you mm. because they all st- they all want to brag that they're a business owner but the reality is you didn't actually create a company you created a job for yourself and like high it, pressure and low pain man and, and you never turn off you heard the nine to nine thing we talked no, well, about well i mean I, I i have but i think the audience would love to hear that too yeah so like you know one of the things we tout as entrepreneurs is like we left the rat race bro and so we'll find a guy that's still in the corporate life or in the quote-unquote rat race and we'll kind of laugh at the fact that he's punching a time clock but the freedom in punching a time clock is at least when you punch out at five, six o'clock, you, you can punch out like mentally, you know, physically, emotionally, et cetera. Whereas entrepreneurs are nine to nine, nine to nine, nine to nine, nine to nine. And that's, that's not nine. That's not nine a.m. to nine p.m. No, it's nine a.m. to nine a.m. to nine a.m. to nine a.m. To, to can't make payroll, to put out the fire, to answer the phones. You don't get to turn off. Everybody's I mean, I, depending I had, on I had you. a bit of yeah. that 9 a.m. to 9 a.m. yesterday. Like I literally had two two calls scheduled yesterday on top of, you know, trying to be a dad on top of, you know, trying to, you know. Picking me up in San Diego. <laughs> picking you all the way up in, in, in San Diego, planning out what we were doing today. And so last night, like I slept like shit, dude. Yeah. I, I woke up probably three, four times with that nine to nine, like grind in, in my head. Like those wheels, you know, never. Yeah, the hamster wheel is impossible to turn off. All you could do is like try to silence it. Put a little WD forty on it so right. it squeaks less. Yeah. So what? What's the uh, like? So I, you know, I've 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 founded and 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 grown multiple eight figure companies. Uh, I know you have as well. What's been the largest company that that you founded, and and you know where is that company today? Uh, I would say the, the bread and butter, like the largest enterprise was the, the collections, you know, we called it a franchise, but it was really a business in a box. Mm. So essentially, um, I got into the collections business, uh, did pretty well. And then I, I uh, scaled out to having two and then a third location, but I was actually still in law school at the time. And so I was starting to see, I was spread so thin, I lacked the capacity to run all three, couldn't again, wasn't developed enough as an entrepreneur and a leader to develop a team to actually like allow me to go to law school and do all the things. So um, what was really happening too was the risk was high because it's a heavy litigated uh, arena, that marketplace of collections. So uh, I was like, hmm, what would it look like to not be liable for these locations two and three, but still eat off of them? And so we developed basically a business in a box model. So I, I turned that into 23 locations over wow. time. Yeah, it was very successful. 700, we employed 700 people nationwide. Um, so we 23 locations? 23 locations. And 700 I was, employees? Yeah, taking an 8% rip off the top of each one. So Man, it's pretty cool, yeah. That's a great little business. Yeah. Actually, I'm, I mean, I'm actually surprised. I already knew about that, but I, you know, <laughs> but that is, that is an impressive, you know, uh, operation. So you had, so like, that's what I call OPE, right? Uh, which is an OPM, which is other people's efforts yeah. and other people's money. money. So you were, you were making, you would go in and you say, hey, I've got this opportunity and you can make X, Y, Z, and this is what it looks like. I'll give you all the things you need from scripts to data to infrastructure. To SOPs, front e- to back, soup everything. to nuts, like basically so I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm going to collapse time for you. Yeah. I'm going to mitigate the risk, and all you have to do is step in and follow my playbook, and you will win. Yeah. But we will win together because I'm going to take 8%. Yeah, and it was a genius model because kind of like McDonald's, if anyone's ever seen um, – What's the, the movie? founder? The founder. Oh, hey. One of the odds. I swear, yeah, that's, that's a weird one. So yeah, so like even things like McDonald's found a way to make money off of the straws and the so on. And so once you start growing your 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 quantity, like think Costco, 
we were we were actually buying debt and volume and so there was a markup on the files because i was getting them out of like if you had 10 grand to throw into the marketplace to buy files and, and collectively my 23 locations we were spending like four or five hundred k a month right you on, got you got economies of scale where you were yeah so it. now we're like first in line we're getting the premium files we're getting them at, at, a, at a price that makes sense and so you're buying power as a result so that's why it grew from to 23 so quickly because if you were like a startup guy that wanted to even step foot in this business you might as well step into the team because you're going to get files at a price that you never would and you're going to get the quality of files you never would with your small buying well power. i mean at the end of the so, day like let's i mean let's not mince words here like being a founder running a successful business this is hard yeah it's extremely hard you know and, and the propensity to fail i think is like 80 85 percent like w- even casinos like think about this casinos have like double the odds in your favor yeah that being an entrepreneur does yeah think about that but yet somehow we think it's a good idea to go take our money and play in this casino of life called being an entrepreneur mm. so what you did is you took like like you you actually kind of reversed the roles and you said hey there's a 15% chance of failure, but that's only if you're a shithead. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And we had a few. Because yeah. the business plan was solid, yeah. but what's the one variable that we can't control? The businessman himself. Right. Yeah. So, so okay, you got seven LLCs going. Mm-hmm. You got one uh, with 23 offices. I mean, that thing had to be cranking off some cash for you. Yeah, I literally, you know, wasn't working and, and doing pretty well, but... Um, yeah, it, I mean, it came to an end. We won't have to get there on this call, but yeah, I, I pretty so, much well, shut it down. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that because I, I think that's important because a lot of people, you know, found companies because they want money, they want yeah. they want time freedom, and then they find themselves imprisoned by the very thing that they they set out to accomplish, right? So I say they they. They, they go out to, to create a palace and they create a prison. They go out to live their dream, but they forgot that a nightmare is still a dream and they're living this recurring nightmare every single day. Now, you weren't necessarily re- like living a recurring nightmare in, in, in professional life, but you know the personal life was, was kind of going to shit, right? Yeah, 100%. And, and it was because like there, there was never enough money. There was a never enough uh, affirmation. There was never enough this because why? Well, like you weren't enough. Yeah. And so now let's let's fast forward because I I think like this is a a really important distinction for people to 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 understand is that, you know, sometimes just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something just because you can have seven LLCs doesn't mean you (laughs) should have seven LLCs just because you can make millions of dollars in, in an arena doesn't mean that you should be making million dollars of that arena, you know, because there are some things that you'll do that'll fill up your coffers, but slowly and quite rapidly put you in a coffin. So what do you do today? Uh, we run this this bad boy here called the program, and I pretty much just help dudes get out of their own way because, um, you know, don't have it mastered yet, but I can tell you that it took me a lot of years and a lot of personal work to get out of my own way, and um, I'm vehemently like committed to the concept that you are are most qualified to lead the person that you used to be Mm. and so i just see so many entrepreneurs out there that are where i was several years ago where money was everything and affirmation was everything and the toys and the watch and the cars and things like everyone had to affirm me and tell me i was awesome because i didn't think i was awesome at my core and so to your point of like my lack of self-worth i try to compensate by building a massive net worth but there wasn't enough money, but there wasn't enough things. There was never was. And so as a result, not only was like, it sounds kind of cliche or corny, but you hear this, you're trying to fill this void, like a hole in your life, but it cannot be filled. I don't care how much money you make and I can prove this to anybody. And so uh, again, as a result, not just myself, but my family life was suffering tremendously because I didn't feel like King Kong inside of my four walls. Mm -hmm. But when I stepped out of my house into the marketplace with all the things I had built and people that I employed, I mean, I was helping guys buy their first house, their first cars, you know, being on the other side of that, that gratitude message of like, you changed my life, at least financially, it was so addicting. Um, But the way that we were earning, I wouldn't say lacked integrity completely. It just was, it was in a marketplace that I'll, I'll personally never step foot in again. Yeah. And and so that's like, you know, you and I, you and I met, right? So we had the pleasure of meeting five years ago. Yeah. 12, 12, 2018. 12, 12, 2018. See, he knows our anniversary. How romantic is that? Um, Oh, pitter pitter patter. Um, Anyway, so we met 12, 12, 18. And the, the irony of like how we met as I was actually sharing my journey and my story of the very same thing. And it's how 
how, you know, financially, like the money was coming in droves, but it was going into this black hole that I could never fill. It didn't matter like how blingy the watch, how fast the car, how beautiful the woman, you know, how, how cool the private jet like it, it like i just i felt empty on the inside and i, I know a lot of people are like oh boo fucking yeah, who yeah. cry me yeah. a river but like <laughs> i think those are people that might not have experienced yeah this. get there get like there. that like, they haven't experienced <laughs> like what i call financially free and emotionally bankrupt yeah. in my mind like that was a failure because when i at least when i was broke I had this hope, right? I call it the lottery ticket syndrome where like I had this hope that someday when I made X, then I would feel Y. Like when I made a million dollars, then then I would feel whole, then I would feel complete. And all that happened was I got to making a million dollars and it just fixed my money problems, which dramatically exposed exposed and amplified everything else. Exactly. Yeah. And so that was <laughs> that was that was gut wrenching because it was like, damn. Unless I want everyone to get there. Like I hope everyone goes out and crushes it because it's just gonna prove the point more rapidly. A hundred percent. And that I mean, this is why most lottery, you know, winners go broke is yeah. because they are they're sort of broken to begin with. Yeah. And so I was on stage sharing my story. And, uh, you know, there was about 1,200 people, 1,500 people in the room. And, I mean, he's, he's no small dude. Mm -hmm. This big barreling guy, speaking of King Kong, you know, coming through the crowd, pushing people out of the way. And he's like, I got to talk to you. I'm like, shit, do I owe this guy money? And uh, so we go and we have, uh, we have appetizers. It was at Seasons 52. He likes to call it the Applebee's. But, you know, I am a bit more romantic than no. taking you to Applebee's on our first date. Alliteration so, is king. App appetizers at Applebee's. App appetizers yeah. at Applebee's. And so uh, anyway, in, within, I mean, 10 minutes, like this, this, this big, strong, you know, weaponized dude is is a ball of mush. Just realizing yeah. that, you know, his 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 life is built on uh, a a pack of lies and and you know built on the backbone of of false positives. Yeah. And so, you know, what what I think is pretty powerful beyond uh, everything about your story was your willingness to literally pivot, mm -hmm. and not not just like a a, a soft. You know, yeah, one degree click. No, yeah, no, this is like is a, a, about face. Yeah, this, is a, this, is a, this, this was like a U turn in the Titanic, you know, like iceberg dead ahead, and you somehow managed to like turn the Titanic and turn it in a completely different direction. Yeah, yeah. you know, and so our our, our first uh, our first session together, um, and this is what he does all day long for for people was we were just whiteboarding right and just kind of like blank canvas. Let, let's just kind of like, let's look at the facts. Let's look at the feelings. Let's separate them both. And let's make a decision that's going to empower you. And so we went through the seven LLCs and we we're going through the pros and the cons of all the things and looking at the numbers. And it was impressive, this beautiful office. And, you know, he had a Windsor not the size of a fucking <laughs> kite. And and uh, looking just great with his three-piece suit on. And, and I looked at this and he said, uh, you said something around, uh, like you said you were on a, uh, a truth mission. Yeah. Or what was the exact phrase? Uh, it's, I mean, it was a truth journey. It was, uh, it, there was that one sentence I wrote down from when you, you spoke at WarriorCon, which is that sentence changed my life. And so like when we had met maybe a week and a half later after that, that lunch was. Oh, your truth agreement. That's what it yeah, was. Yeah, I wrote the truth agreement. The yeah, truth agreement. Yeah. And so like since 12, 12, 18, um, cause we had journals at that, that event. Um, I just, I, I was a lawyer at the time, obviously amongst all the other <laughs> LLCs, but I crafted an agreement and committed to never tell a lie ever again, which is by the way, the hardest thing on the planet earth. Um, but when you, you lie you, every day, when you put that lens over, so that was the filter in which I just basically ran everything through. So by the time you got there and we were whiteboarding like the seven sources of income and like what's serving me and what's not, when you throw that lens of truth over it, it was, it was clear to me that not one particular way that I was earning was in alignment with my core values because I was so obsessed with the money. I was willing to kind of like deviate from who I was at my core. And I mm. was like, I was, I wouldn't say disgusted with myself, but I was like, okay, there must be a better way. Right. So, um, yeah, it was, it was one of those, when you talk about pivot, the conversation was basically burn the boat and not just one boat, burn every oh. single boat, go yeah, home yeah, and tell yeah. your family, like you no longer make 
this much money, you no longer have passive income, you are starting from scratch, you are doing, you know, so it was a, it was a crazy one. Yeah, so I remember that we had the whiteboard all full and like, and that, there was like this little thing over here. I'm like, what, what's that? And you're like, well, that's what I really want to do. I, yeah. said, are, I said, are you doing that? No, no, but I've always had this like vision for my life. I've always had this calling and being compelled to do this. And I'm like, then why aren't you doing that? Well, and then all, all of a sudden all the stories come up, right? Well, uh, this and that, bada bing, bada boom, you know? And then I was like, well, like you told me that you have this truth agreement and like all these things right here, they, they sort of lack, like the, the, they lack truth. They yeah. lack like the harsh full, truth, full truth, the yeah. full truth. Yeah. And so what are you willing to do? And I mean, I gotta be honest, I wasn't expecting you to be like, you know, <laughs> I can't say that I'm, 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 I'm going to go. Yeah. Sorry. I like, I got, I got to, uh, like when I thought about it, I was like, there's no fucking way. Cause I don't know if I would have had the courage to burn down multiple seven figure businesses to resurrect and build the life that I ultimately wanted to, right? Um, my story was a little different. Like I kind of was forced into, into submission, but you did it through like just complete surrender. Yeah. And uh, so like now you, you, you're doing that one thing, which is crazy. Like to think about the whiteboard and how complex it was and all the LLCs and all the companies you had founded to now going and stepping into this passion project called the program. Like you're literally the, a product of the product. Like you had to reprogram yourself. Yeah. Like talk about that journey. Like how difficult was that? I could tell you some like some massive like pivotal moments for me. Like th this is one where I think men struggle in general, especially my fathers out there. Is is um, what I call taking taking off the superhero cape. Mm -hmm. Like I think as men, obviously we're expected to have all the answers figured out, provide, don't share emotions, you know, push it all down, figure it out, provide, problem solve, problem solve. And then when you go home and tell your babies who have had like private lessons and trips to Europe and, you know, I think at that time I at least had one 16 year old. So she had a new car and you're basically you, to sit in front of your kids and say like, dad, dad had a, a moral epiphany on 12, 12, 2018. And, and he's living his whole life under this new truth agreement. And as a result, I'm going to burn down several sources of our income and everything's going to change. And my decision to, to make this massive pivot is drastically going to affect the quality of your life at least at least monetarily right and like when you play that scenario in your head at first you're like there's no way and there's an a i'm not doing it because they didn't mess up or they didn't make these decisions or they shouldn't have to suffer or they right. you know there's there's so many stories again that they, they start bubbling up and you're like i can't do this to my family but the reality is what i was doing to my family as a result prior was to worse. was way worse and so like anyway I, I call it taking the superhero cape off and i think i think it, I know, and my kids will tell you this as well, because they've actually been on my stage and shared some stories. Um, it was one of the most powerful moments, and my relationship with my kids as a result <laughs> of that conversation. I hate this shit. Yeah, I mean, I think I think everybody like it's the most powerful thing you could do is show vulnerability in front of your kids because it allows like I have a son, and like I don't want him to grow up and think like fucking you know tough it out, men don't cry. Like I I remember specifically disciplining him one time at a family event and i would say this to him all the time i would say tuck that fucking lip in boy like tuck your lip like we don't fucking cry you don't you fucking cry and i remember an uncle on my wife's my wife's side right so you know in-law comes up to me and he was like proud of the way that i was able to like take my son from a meltdown if you will and the, kid, mm. the kid's like seven years old to like just he literally was like biting his lip and, and pushing all of his emotions down and i was fucking proud of that moment because I was the fucking man, and I was I was raising a man, you know what I mean? And like, it can't be, it couldn't be more ass backwards. And obviously, I don't encourage certain things. Like, just I, I don't know. It's it's been a crazy ride, man. But like, the the one eighty just in the parenting style, and it, the reality is, you don't know what you don't know. And in that moment, again, I felt like the fucking man. And the amount of damage you do to your kid when you tell him it's not okay to just express the crazy shit that's going on in your head, right. push it all down. Those are the kids that like. Those are kids you know, that like blow that's, up. That's and, the Columbine kid. Yeah, yeah, and obviously not that far for most of us, but like you know, he was at, at one point punching holes in walls in his room. Of he, course, because no, outlet. like it, ha it has to, like it's a yeah. pressure cooker. It has to come off, right? But like, I mean, right? What you're witnessing right here, I got chills coursing my body. It's fucking priceless. <laughs> like, like put a price on that. Like, tell me that's not worth multiple seven figures. Tell me that. And like the relationship that you have with your son now. Mm -hmm. You guys moved to Nashville and spent, you know, a year together, like yeah, best friends and, and roommates. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, he's going to cherish that. Like coming from a dude that doesn't have a dad anymore. I mean, I have a dad, but not on this earth. Like, dude, I, 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 
I, I can't. I, I, I would pay anything. I would give up everything I have to have one last walk and talk with my father. You know, and likely if you didn't make that decision, if we don't go through this truth agreement, we don't sift and sort through all the things that you founded and actually build a foundation, like you're fucked. Yeah, 100%. You're fucked. So where is the program at today? Like, so just to recap, seven LLCs, a law degree. Yeah. You know, mul multiple offices, passive income, you know, seven fi multiple seven figures a year, the cars, the house, the trophy wife, but like living in a world of fucking misery and shit has a has a moment of introspection and what we call the man in the mirror moment and says this does not serve me i am a servant to this and no longer will i do that has a radically um, uh, honest conversation with his family and he burns the ships does an about face on all of that income and goes into like this this what more of a prophetic business and and, and you know to to pursue his profits so yeah. like how's that journey been um, you know, the financials definitely aren't there. You know, I actually said this from stage the other day in Vegas at my event. I don't make anywhere near what I was making, but I fly out of bed every day. And I would argue this, you know, with anybody like to the death that like when you're on this side of the fence and this was when, when you talked about like, even in collections, the only thing that kept me going that long in collections with the 700 employees over time was the kids that I was helping in my opinion, better their lives. And so right. like, the only way I even was able to sustain, cause I just at some point could not stand the marketplace, the quality of people, et cetera. Like what led to this, you know, this is what I want to do. I know it because at my core, I feel like this is what fills my cup was helping those young kids, you know, mm. you know, get some pretty big wins and kind of change the trajectory of how they, they were showing up in this world. Um, all that to say, I personally am making less money I've ever made. And obviously there's a long game being played here, but, um, I've created more wealth in the marketplace than I've ever created, like 10x, mm. you know? So what I was able to do by myself with those LLCs and, and collections and my law firm and other other ways of earning um, pales in comparison to what I've actually created in, in the market. Like we've created a lot of wealth, you know, a lot of millionaires, a lot of guys that are crushing it. Um, how, how many how many millionaires? Uh, it's four, uh, we're actually closer to 17, but I'm still iffy on what qualifies as uh, classifies as a millionaire. So we still just tout the number 14. And so you've created 14. So, so you left multiple millions and then in pursuit of, you know, what you were called to do and, and the man you've been called to be the, how you've been called to live, who you've been called to lead. And as a result, you've created 14 millionaires. Yeah. Again, I, I just, I always have to caveat and throw this term around a little loosely because I just obviously assets and things like that and percentage of equity and ownership and companies. But um, yeah, I mean, a lot of people don't know what net worth is. Like yeah. you could be a millionaire and not have a million in your bank. Just FYI for the, for the novice that's out there for, or even the, the new founder. It's like, Oh, you know, like I've been a millionaire on paper. I've been a millionaire, like from a liquidity perspective. And I've also been negative millions, but that didn't mean every time I logged into my bank account, yeah. there there was a negative deficit of millions. It's your net worth, which is your assets minus your liabilities equals your net worth, right? And we don't really count like your home as your yeah. as part of your net worth. Yeah, some people do, <laughs> some people do, but yeah. even as an accredited investor, they won't count the equity in your home because you got to live somewhere. So this would be like what your business is worth, what you owe on that business, what you owe everything else would be your net worth. So he's created businesses that are worth multiple millions of dollars for the people that he, he serves. Right. And he's also created, you know, quite frankly, people there's been that some are, liquid, yeah, very, that very big that, liquid that are making yeah. millions of dollars a year. But, um, yeah, it's just, I, I always want to push back on that because I, I hate, I'm one of my, the biggest proponents of like why we created this program and why we're, we're, we're stamping this particular industry a certain way is there's a lot of guys out there selling bullshit and I don't ever want to purport to say like, come hang out with me. You're you'll, talking you'll be about, a to be specific, yeah. <laughs> you're talking about like coaches, masterminds, Yeah, the personal mentors, development game. Gurus, yeah, yeah. You know? I think it's just, it's, it's, it's people out there wolfing tickets and I, I'm always trying to like, like, and, and anything I say out loud, I can, I can publish in, in, in data, you know, like we have a 6.3 X ROI against our, one of our mid tier packages. Right. And I, I so have just, let's, let's break that down. What he means is for every dollar that someone invests into the program, they get $6.3 back on average. So if they invest $30,000 into his program, they can expect to get back almost $200,000. 
right in that same calendar year yeah within this, the calendar year so like but then but then conversely you know we've got a lower tier program where we don't serve the financial side as much because some of these guys that are in there aren't business owners yet they're still 1099 they're trying to get out of the quote unquote rat race and so that one doesn't tout an identical ROI because they're not in a position for me to pull the right levers to get them to win quicker mm. um, so yeah I'm, I'm just it's so crazy I, and this is how I feel everyone should be like I'm, a, I'm, I'm so wide open like even my wife and my my um I don't have partners per se, but I have a staff that I'm equally as transparent with. So I share everything. Like I'm actually what I'm what I'm trying to do right now is actually build another eight figure company out in the public eye, while my members watch. So then it can yeah, defeat you, their story. So, so you're you're basically as like, they say eating uh, your own dog. Food, yeah, hundred you know? percent. So watch me go from zero dollars, like no net worth, no. I'm burning every bridge. Watch me go from absolute nothing. And I'll use the principles and the tools that I that practice I'm and teaching preach. You. Yeah, because I'm a product of the product, like right. you said. I'm just going to do exactly what I'm showing you guys to do. And if I create. Um, a new vertical here and it, it ends in a course and it's got this ROI and this is my sequence and my nurture sequence and my leads. Like, I'll just give you everything because what's been proven, again, it, it, the, the, my, my, my biggest gripe with this personal development industry is this. Everybody's going and looking for the answer. Mm. Everyone is paying money to go to events, to go to seminars, to go in front of the gurus, to take a, a screenshot or get on social or post a fucking picture that says that they saw, you know, Andy Elliott or Frisella or my like all the and I, these people are all great. I have no issue with the people because the reality is, the stuff that they're selling from stage works because it only has to work for one time to show that it's it, it gets to what we call proof of concept phase. The concept has been proven because one dude proved it. The problem is. It's never ever the business plan. It's the businessman, and you're not Frisella, and you're Amen. not Andy Elliott, and you're not Milet, and you're not Bradley, and you're not any of these guys. And so, for you to show up, two thousand guys showed up to an Arte event in Nashville, Tennessee, two thousand people. And I know all two thousand of those didn't just take all the gold from stage and write it in their journal and go home and win. Because if that was, if it was that easy, everyone would just be fucking winning. And so, my frustration is like, there's what I get paid to do, and I get paid pretty well. Is let me scoot this thing out to hold up a mirror and a soundboard. That's mm -hmm. it. Every time a guy comes to me, like we, I ask him powerful questions that allow him to basically ascertain the answers on his on his own. Because otherwise, we got we did fuck all. Like if you just keep coming to me and I just keep giving you the solutions, bro. And and that's why I'm so adamant about here's the framework. Here's how I did it. Here's how you here's how you say it. Here's the tone. Here's the inflection. Here's how many touches it takes. Here's the exact copy that you use. You got a marketing problem? No, no. You know what I mean? Like every every hole that you have operationally in your business, I'll I'll plug it just to prove the real point, which is it has nothing to do with all this shit that you think it has to do with. Right. It's all right here and right here. And until you get that shit straight, good luck. Yeah. Good yeah. Luck. You, like, you, you, <laughs> you, could, you could hand somebody, you could hand somebody. Dude, this is literally why like the franchise world, like if you look at the franchise world, yeah. kind of similar to what you were doing. Like people, like you have to, like you have to vet the person that's going to buy a franchise yes. from you because a lot of franchises fail, not because the franchise failed, not because the marketing failed, but because the operator failed. Yep. The operator failed. Even the most well-funded businesses fail because the business man or woman over the business plan. Yeah. Like I love that you're saying, guys, this is what I'm doing. This is my routine. This is what I this is what I practice. Therefore, this is what I preach, and this is what you pay me for. But you also pay me for this, what you just said. Perspective. Yeah. Because I'm gonna hold up a mirror and I'm gonna show you that you are not doing what you are required to do therefore you will not have what you want to have period the end and i could sum up our entire movement in four in four four steps you know this is this is what i do for a living so step one we create the gap so if you came to me and you said nick i'm here i want to be here right i'm at a i'd love to see what b looks like cool bro number one your B is thinking too small, so I'm gonna stretch it out, and it's gonna be a C. How many guys come to you where, where, like, like they're they're making a hundred k, two hundred k, and and like they they go, I just want to get to a half a million bucks. Yeah, take home half a million. Yeah, yeah, it's very common. Yeah. And they're like, so it's like life changing, and it is for most people. You could do just about anything you want if you're taking home five, six hundred k a year. Yeah, but they're like, why not? Why not go to a million? Yeah, I, well, because you know it's easier to to ten x than it is the two x, and people don't understand that. So step so. one is create the gap. You're gonna they're gonna they're gonna tell you a number. It's likely gonna be too small. You're gonna stretch them to. Well, so the gap gets crazy because they come in and this is their A to B. I don't know if you can see this on the screen, right? And so you're you're thinking too small. So I take your B way over here, but then you're also a liar. So you're not really where you say you are because you want to <laughs> so you have you So now you're here. So they come to you like, bro, like I I thought my gap was here. You just extended my gap. Why on earth would I pay you? You're, you're showing me more work. Well, the reality is we collapse time for a mm. living because the, what, what happens when we get to work? So like we set your A, we set your B, we get you really clear on it. Then so that step one is create the gap. 
Then we build the map and map is an acronym for massive action plan. So we create this granular reverse engineered massive action plan that we hold you fiercely accountable to. And the crazy thing is step three, then we attack the gap by using the map. When we attack this gap, that's when the work starts. And I think this is where everyone else is falling short. Because again, if you go to an event and you say, I want to be here, bro. And the guy gets on stage and he's where you want to be. He is your letter B. He's making the money. He's got the muscles, the, the wife, the cars, whatever the fuck, right? He, he represents your letter B. And then he tells you how he got there. And then maybe he even goes as far as if you sign up or whatever they do to give you his step-by-step. -step. So now you've got the gap, the map, and then he says, go home and get to work. So first place guys fails. They don't go home and they get to work. They go home and they don't have the goosebumps and the feel goods and the mic drop moments and the shit they wrote in their journal and all, of, all the bullshit. They go right back to old habits. So step three usually knocks a lot of guys off. Step four is not even being taught in the marketplace. And this is what we're trying to change. The real work, when I say create the gap, build the map, attack the gap, and then here's step four, expose the gaps, multiple gaps. And when I say expose, it's not operational inefficiencies. You, you're not like, you're, it's not that you're not a good marketer. There's a story there. It's not that you're not a good builder of people. You just haven't leveled up yet. You don't, you don't trust yourself. You don't believe in yourself. You have you have um, imposter syndrome is obviously one of the one that gets thrown around a lot. But all that to say, the real gaps show up in the way that your patterns in this world have been have been screwing you over left and right. Like every single person I've ever met has some form, if not multiple forms, of self sabotage, mm. and those are exposed as soon as we get to work. And so that, steps one, two, and three are crucial. But step four is when I go, hmm. Well, you, so 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 you so step one, create the gap, build, build the, the map, map, attack the gap, yep. but then that expose that them. that, that expose, exp the expose yeah. because now you get to see like, hey, dude, you you have everything. Yeah. You know where you are, where you want to go. You know what's standing in the way. You haven't. You have a, a formative blueprint. This is what you've been begging for. Yeah. Why aren't you executing, like yeah. executing? <laughs> Because now, now we got to get down to the underlying issue. Because it's now it's not market economics. It's not like yeah. business plan. Interest there's, rates there, are there, up. There, yeah, there, yeah. There's something inside of that person, like a limiting belief. You know, you have this thing called raising the bar, yeah. like or lowering the bar. It's their discipline or lack thereof that's actually keeping them from what they what they want. Yeah. Listen, we're here to tell you, as a founder, you can have anything that you want in this world as long as you are radically honest and. Rude ruthlessly committed the end like in fact part of what i preach and teach inside of the next 90 and and how we get people from scale to sell he gets them to to, to a, a certain place there's a handoff we take them to that next place of scale to sell the, the fun found a, a fundamental element of our equation our exit formula the very first element is what we call i V, which is imitus veritas, which means merciless truth. And it was a phrase that came from, from Nick. In fact, he had it tattooed in his lip at one point. But it's it kind of crazy. Sidebar. It came out. His tattoo out of his lip came out. It was almost like he, it, he got to a point where it was impossible to even like put a lie into his mouth. And uh, it's no longer there. But this, this fundamental mental element of like the truth. What do you want? Why do you want it? What's standing in the way? What are you willing to do? And what are you not doing currently that's in alignment with what you said that you want? Yeah. And so create the gap, build the map, attack the gap, and then expose the holes inside of both your map and your attack because that is where the true problems lie. 100%. Is inside the lies in the stories. 100%. And that's the point is like, you know, when you say what's in the way, people are like, well, what's in the way is the market. What's in the way? No, what's in the way is you, my man. Right. And can, as soon as you own that, then we can get to work. So so just, you're obviously yeah. a product of the product. So here's a guy who had nothing like or actually I shouldn't say that had everything yeah. like put himself into a place of of like what would, what most would think is scarcity. But he was living abundantly to know that there's so much abundance in this world that you're willing to walk away from something that is comfortable, but it still makes you like uncomfortable knowing what you're doing. Like, and then you became a product of the product. You've created a multiple seven figure brand with the, uh, with, with the program. Um, like give us a case study. You have to say the person's name for anonymity sake, but sure. give us a case study of someone who came in, you know, sort of was doubting like the program, doubting themselves, doubting you. Yeah, obviously they're doubting themselves. They're like your sure. your results are undeniable, but well, I tell people that all the time. I'm not even asking you to believe in me. A lot, a lot of people will, will, pro will project yeah. though. They'll be like, oh, this doesn't work. Sure, because they don't. They, it's easier. Exactly. Yeah. So give us a, like a, a case study. 
Um, I mean, I've got some, like, we, we have a, a young kid that sold his wife's minivan, and they were sharing a car. And uh, he's, our, he's our youngest seven-figure guy, so that's always a fun one. He basically came to our very first event, and um, so I just don't know if it qualifies in terms of the doubt, other than after the two-and-a-half-day event, he was convinced enough that this was where he needed to be that he called his wife and said, hey, um, the ticket is X. I'd rather pay it in full because we can save a pretty decent amount. And Oh, by the way, it will fully commit me for the year. Um, we're going to sell the van. And again, that was their sole vehicle uh, at the time. And he, uh, he sold it. He paid for his whole year up front. And again, this, he was like probably 23 at the time, 24. And um, in the course of his first year, maybe 14, 16 months, because he's still with us, um, he started to really step into what he was worth, you know? Because again, like, I can't tell you how, how much like lack of self-worth and, and like mm. this self-belief is what holds most men back, at least in my experience. And uh, he had basically been working for a company and they weren't uh, treating him well in terms of like he wanted an ownership piece or an equity piece, et cetera. And so um, we convinced him to go out into the marketplace and let's see what let's see what the, how the marketplace values. Yeah, what they think you're worth. Yeah, and he got some pretty interesting offers and uh, one offer that was kind of like too good to pass up. So he, he wrestled with it from a place of like loyalty and morality and said, look, I'm going to go entertain this offer because they at least see what I'm worth. And within 24 hours of, of notifying his current employer, if you will, um, he he wound up with a pretty decent equity stake. Again, I don't want to give out the numbers, but um, he, he his net worth far exceeded seven figures within a matter of forty eight hours of making that move. Wow! But it really but the, the interesting thing is obviously that's a it's not even a Cinderella story. It's just there's different ways to do it. Is what I'm trying to say because I would lo- I have several guys that like well they started here we built the thing we did the thing they bought the they, they're now they're making this, um, but it's not always that. A lot of it is not really like about building big things sometimes it's about figuring out that you're already worth what you're worth and, and right. until you're willing to see it and take ownership of that um, and then leverage yeah. that ownership from a place of like i know who i am and what i'm worth and i'm going to be compensated whether by you or somebody else in the market well big things get built by big believers yeah that's it big things get built by big believers i've actually never said it that way but i, I like it i i'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna take it, <laughs> gonna and, take and, it run, and, and run with it because big things get built by big believers like any of these you know entrepreneurs ceos founders that you admire they were just big fucking believers and that belief man of in yourself and it transcends into people transcends into culture transcends into all the things and eventually that person has exactly what they believe, right? Because it, it's about like raising the bar. One of the things that Nick, um, you know, ha- has taught me is this this acronym of raising the bar, B A R, which is belief, action, result. Yeah. You have a belief, you take an action that's in alignment with your belief, not the other way around, and then you get a result that amplifies your belief and uh, you know, or or proves and your it belief. Can serve you or not serve you? Right. Yeah. You could say, yeah. you know, one of the examples you use is I'm shitty at interviewing, right? And then I go on a job. And I show up and I do a shitty job at interviewing. Therefore, I get the result of not getting a job, which then affirms my belief that I'm a shitty interviewer, right? And round and round you go. Right. It's actually, there's a scientific name. It's called the Pygmalion effect, P-Y-G-M-A-L-I-O-N, or the self-fulfilling prophecy. You may have heard it as. But basically, you're creating your own environment daily with your belief systems, with your stories. Like, again, one of my more, more direct quotes around this topic specifically is we don't see through our eyes. We see through our stories. Mm. Like, you and I can witness a car accident and if you're on a different corner than I am we are we are vehemently opposed to who caused the accident what caused the accident what the conditions were etc and we're so married to our version of the truth because to us it's truth we refuse to consider that the other person's side may hold some and some they water. might have seen it differently correctly and so and so it's just like and then round and round we go and then when you when you can open your your conscious up to the fact that like there's multiple truths out there like yeah. in the story they're telling themselves I'm not good etc and it doesn't serve them it may hold true, and it does because, again, it reaffirms and round and round we go. But what if you were to adopt a new story and, and then realize that that story has an equal amount of truth to it? Right. And this is where I lose a lot of my guys. I think it's woo-woo until we put it into practice. Like, you have the power to, to choose whatever story you want. So what if you woke up and said, I'm the baddest mother effort interviewer on the planet Earth? I do every day. <laughs> when they say sell the pen, I sell the pen better than anybody. I'm right. the, I am the pen seller, right? Because right. I've seen a lot of guys you know, go ostrich when that line happens in a job interview. Like you're talking a big game, you've got a cool resume, and they're like, cool, sell me this pen. Right. And then guys go, right. 
<laughs> you know I mean, like I'm done. Uh, all that to say, what if you had a powerful story that you believe at your core at a subconscious level? I can't stress this enough. I don't know how much time we have to get into that. But like if you believe it at your core at a subconscious level, then your actions are such you show up, your, your posture is better, your, your shoulders are rolled back. Maybe you did not go to like Marshalls or Ross and get the shirt and, and, and tie combo and fucking shit green. Like maybe you, you actually got dressed properly. You beefed up your resume. You didn't bring it in some wrinkled ass old paper with like no updates. Just the way that you the way you walk through that door, like your, your chances go through the roof of getting the job, right? And, and conversely, if you don't believe in yourself, then you do all the opposite. You you shuffle into the door. You've already conceded defeat. You kind of half ass it, and then you go, "I knew I was right." Here, here's the, one of the most powerful lines you'll ever hear from me on the planet Earth, and this is a fact: human beings are the only animal on the planet Earth that would rather be right than actually experience a win. Mm. Like we are so obsessed with confirmation bias and this is why people stay in shitty jobs or even shitty relationships like battered women syndrome. There are women out there and because they know their man's launch sequence and they know it ends with a smack on the face, that behavior is so predictable that they would rather stay in that relationship and, and be right and say, I knew it. I knew he was going to hit me. I knew he's a wife beater. I knew all these things. That addiction to the dopamine release of being correct is more powerful than the pain that they feel when they get hit upside the head and they never leave that relationship. And it happens on, and this is the very crass, you know, drastic example, but it, an example nonetheless, everybody would rather be right, even if right is not winning. Like the I told you so, like dunking on your wife in a conversation when you know you didn't really win, you didn't get the result. She, she wants to punch you in the face, but you would rather from a place of I'm awesome and I'm right, that feeling of being right, you're more married to that than the actual outcome that you say that you desire. Well, and that's it's how insane. And, yeah. that, and, and that's how like most founders are. What, what if the story for a founder wasn't that like, I have to fight alone? What if the story wasn't that like, it has to be hard or no one, no one knows the pain that I feel and you know, they isolate and they, they disconnect and they make it harder on themselves. What if they, what if they had a new story? What if, what if there's a way that, you know, they could, you know, basically get out of their own way. Well, yeah. I believe there is a way, right? There, there is a way, and that that way is called the program, <laughs> yeah. right? So, like, we got to wrap it up here in a I second. I don't plug ever, so he's going to try and no, plug. No, like of course I'm going to plug it. <laughs> so, where can people where can people find you? Reprogram.ai, uh, timewithnick.net. If you're on this live or you if you know Nick Long, like I, I won't push you to one of my coaches. I'll take your call myself. So time with timewithnick.net. Nick. So actually, yeah. though, you can go to the real Nick Alfano, right? Is that that's uh, the Instagram handle? I think it's just the Nick Alfano. The Nick yeah. Alfano. It's just the. Yeah. They're like it, the real is already implied in the the. <laughs> the Nick Alfano. Uh, reprogram. Dot AI. Yeah. Dot AI. And what's the Insta handle for a program? Uh, I think it's reprogram everything. Reprogram everything. So yeah. I know that's a lot of things, yeah, but yeah. it's it's reprogram.ai or the Nick Alfano, yep. the Nick Alfano. You can find him on the page. I'm going to tag him here. Have a conversation. What he's talking about time with Nick.net is he's willing to enter into a conversation with you, with you as a founder. There is nobody on planet earth. I trust more to take people from a nothing to a multiple seven, eight figure, something, someone that's stuck at a hundred, K blast through to seven figures. Someone that's stuck at seven figures blast through to eight figures. Like I invest a lot of my time and energy into the program, both as a, 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 a mentor, but as uh, to the, to, to the students, but also as a student, because I learn something every time I come, this movement is leveling up like crazy. Mm -hmm. And we have this nice little handoff because I'm in the game of not being an entrepreneur, but being an exitpreneur. Exitpreneur is going to be the new thing that people are going to be chasing down. Like I, I am so evangelical about this. That is what my mission is. And I couldn't do it like without a man like this and specifically this man. So head over to reprogram.ai, like fill out a form, say you, you saw the founders table podcast, get on a call. He'll do a 30 minute strategy session with anybody. This is extremely valuable. Follow him at the Nick Alfano on Instagram. DM him and uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, man, nothing crazy. I, I'll tell you this: like when we when we tout these things around like millionaires, the, the reason we can confidently say that, and I think this is where guys are falling short, is no one really knows what their business is worth, and they don't know how to package and position mm. it to where it actually has a value. Um, and there's really some really simple levers that need to be pulled. And it's again, it's a case of you don't know what you don't know. And so my, my job in this world, and I've figured out my lane pretty succinctly is take guys from six to seven is pretty easy. Um, seven to eight is where I shine. And then I pass them off because like, I'm not the exit guy. I'm not the guy that has access to the capital and everything you need to, to pull the thing off. But what I definitely do is make sure that we 
build it with the exit in mind. And I, again, if, if every single entrepreneur stepped into this world that's so cool all of a sudden with the exit in mind, the way that you would operate, every single decision that you make, like, and all of a sudden your business is worth like on average three to four times more than what it could ever have been worth just with some simple, simple moves. But exactly. the lack of knowledge is what's killing most. So anyway, I just want to, it's, it's important to me, like, I don't know. Anything that ever comes out of my mouth can be backed up six ways from Sunday because I, I just I, again I'm trying to break through the noise of all the bullshit. Well, I've seen there. it. I've, I've <laughs> so seen it. Like, so yeah, if, if you want the, if you want the truth, if you want the steps, if you if you want to know what your gap is, you want to have a map, you want to have a plan of attack, and you want to know how to constantly expose like how to close that gap. There's nobody better on planet Earth. And uh, again, like the end in mind is peace in mind because a business that can scale is a business that can sell, and a business that can sell is a business that can scale so we'll always like tout those things but you got to start with the reprogramming and this is the guy to do it so thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the founders table with my man nick alfano anthony basilio and i will be back busting balls breaking bread and having real conversations set for you here at the founders table all right y'all we're out